Before I begin, um, let us have a, a word of prayer together. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, we thank you for the great gift of Scripture, Holy Scripture, which bears witness to your grace and love in your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to be attentive listeners to and readers of the Word, that we may come to know you better, to love each other more, and to embrace the world that you have given us for witness and mission. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, th th thank you, Peter. That was a great introduction, um, <clears throat> especially on the theme of the theological interpretation of Scripture. Uh, it's a phrase that we throw around a lot at Wycliffe, and uh, as Peter indicated, it is some, somewhat mystifying. I mean, it is kind of intrinsically mystifying, because strictly speaking, theological interpretation of Scripture is a redundancy. I mean, if it's scripture, the only way to read it is theologically. <laughs> um, I mean, if it's a collection of documents from the ancient Near East or the Roman Empire, uh, such as you might study in the Near Eastern Studies program at the University of Toronto or in the Religious Studies Department, um, and you know, that's a legitimate way of approaching these texts, but that, that's a very different context from reading these texts in the church as scripture. So the question is, how did we arrive where we are today um, where we have to actually signal a theological intention by calling it theological interpretation of scripture? Last year, Dr. Radner and I taught a course, a seminar, mixed MDiv and uh, doctoral seminar on theological interpretation where we spent a minimum of time on theory, maybe just the first four weeks, on kind of the theory of theological interpretation, and then spent the rest of the semester reading um, a range of texts in both the Old and the New Testament in an attempt to figure out what this strange animal, theological interpretation of scripture is. Um, we had a ball in that course. We just had so much fun. I think the students had fun. And by the end of it, uh, we did arrive at the conclusion that Peter has already indicated, namely, whatever theological interpretation of scripture is, it's not a method. <laughs> um, it's not a kind of meat grinder where you put in the text and you, you apply your method and you get a, an assured result at the other end. It's as much art as it is science, and perhaps more art than it is science. Um, and, and this is because it's not, ideally, theological interpretation is not method-driven, it's subject matter driven. It is God, or the triune God, driven. And um, so the questions are generated by the church's faith, the church's constant attempt to hear the word of God. So rather than talk about theological interpretation, let, let, let's try to do some today. Um, uh, before I get around to that, um, let, let me just... Uh, um, I want to signal for you um, some, some possible dangers, things to avoid. So here's two things to avoid and maybe something not to avoid. So the first thing to avoid is, you don't need to write this down. You don't need to write this down. Um, first of all, never tell anybody you're working on a book. Because if you tell them you're working on a book, then you run into them a year from now, and they'll say, hey, Joe, how's your book going? And uh, you know, it reminds me of the story of the two professors. They were old friends, but they never saw each other very often except at conferences. So they run into each other at a conference. And Professor A says to Professor B, hey, how's it going? Well, how's life these days? And Professor B says, oh, I'm, I'm working on a book. And Professor A says, oh, that's interesting, neither am I. Um, and those of you who live the life of a professor and advising students and reading dissertation chapters, it is hard to get around to writing those books you brought. So don't tell anybody you're working on a book. Um, of course, I've just, I'm about to do that here. Um, uh, secondly, second, another thing not to do, don't tell anybody you're writing a book on the Gospel of John. And the reason you don't do that is that then when you run into them a year later, they will invariably say to you, so, how is your commentary on John going? And I will say, 
who said anything about a commentary on John? Now, I know I wrote a commentary on the book of Revelation, and that was, from a human point of view, a series of accidents. I kind of stumbled into that project. And it, was, it was divinely foreordained. I've come to realize in hindsight. But from a human point of view, it was just a series of accidents and a friend of mine saying, you know, we had a contributor drop out, and we need somebody to write the Revelation uh, uh, entry in the Brazos series. Um, so I kind of got drawn into this theological interpretation thing, interestingly, through the apocalypse. Now that's a baptism of fire <laughs> in terms of theological interpretation of scripture. Interestingly, another author, probably called, called John. But anyway, I'm not writing a commentary on John. Um, I'm, the idea for this book um, was, as Peter has indicated, was to explore the church, to explore ecclesiology through an engagement with the fourth gospel. And um, I, that was just one of these bright ideas that one has. And as I got deeper and deeper into the project, I, I began to ask myself, what have I let myself in for here? Because, I mean, and it has been a process of discovery. Um, because one of the things I've learned is that you can't go into the Gospel of John and just extract the ecclesiology just like that. Um, the church is, I think, deeply woven into the fabric of the fourth gospel, but it's not there on the surface. And so to try to access it in some direct, I mean, the word ecclesia doesn't appear anywhere in John. Actually, it's only, it only rarely appears in the other gospels as well is quite an in interesting sort of fact. Um, so you can't just go in there and extract the juices. So, so I, I was kind of struggling with this book and trying to figure out how do you, what, what's going to be the mix of theological exegesis and sort of straight, straight up theology and how do I structure it organizationally and so on. Um, and sort of just struggle. So this is part of why the book has taken a while to gestate. So that, that now, so here's my third piece of advice, and this is positive, positive advice, something you should do. Something you should do is to show your work in progress to friends. And uh, not quite a year ago, there's a group of theologians, friends of mine, guys that I went to graduate school with, and we get together, and I was showing them some of my uh, work in progress on, on this text on ecclesiology in John. Um, with the working title, by the way, which Peter, I told Peter, is maybe put a hold on that. Um, I was working with the title, The True Vine, The Church as Israel in the Gospel of John. That was kind of the working title. The True Vine, The Church as Israel in the Gospel of John. So I got together with my friends last June, and I showed them a draft of a chapter, and the, the draft of the chapter happened to be on the cleansing of the temple and the temple theme generally in the fourth gospel. Well, my friends gave me some very positive feedback, some good helpful critique, and they wanted to hear more of my, I mean, actually they said the things to me that I often say to doctoral students when I read dissertation chapters. And the major thing they said to me, which I also say to doctoral students is, you have a theme, but you don't have a thesis. That's really important. You have a theme of the church, but you don't have a thesis. But they said, but you do have a thesis. And it's this temple idea. That is to say, although the book will continue to be an exploration of ecclesiology through the fourth gospel, it will have an explicit focus on themes of temple and sacrifice. So my new working title, which when I run into you a year from now, you will remind me of and embarrass me, but hopefully not. Um, the new working title is Temple, Church, and Sacrifice, a Johannine Ecclesiology. So that, so I'll be getting to the temple part today, not so much the sacrifice or the explicitly ecclesiological part, but, but the, the temple part. Um, so here, so on your outline, I've given you two things. I've given you one handout that has both of the texts that we'll be dealing with today, the cleansing of the temple, so-called, in John chapter 2, and the woman, Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. But before we get to the text, I, I want to talk about the importance of reading John. There are many, many reasons for reading John, but let me mention four in particular. First of all, John potentially, 
unsettles our canonical habits or preferences. It gets us out of our well-worn grooves of thought. Anglicans and other mainline Protestants in the audience, if there's any Roman Catholics here, I think this will apply as well, will know both the gift and the limitations of the lectionary. I do think the lectionary is a gift, but it is a gift that has its limitations, and you need to work with and sometimes around the lectionary. Sometimes you need to subvert the letter of the lectionary to honor its spirit. Um, for much of the church year, the lectionary gives us a steady diet of the synoptic gospels, and then I think we get, when do we get most of our John? We get it in Passion Tide with the Passion Narrative, and then after Pentecost, there are these you know, unending weeks when all you have is the bread of life. Sort of lot, lots of, you kind of choke on the bread of life after a while. Um, um, now, the thing is, I think that the focus on the synoptics through much of the church year that we have in the lectionary, I think it feeds some of our Anglicans, some of our worst habits as Anglicans. Or maybe this is not so much an Anglican thing as just a modern North American thing. See, so here, here's, here's what I think happens. The lectionary, or the synoptics, gives us these fairly brief, intense episodes um, that show Jesus during his ministry. Uh, as a friend of mine pointed out recently in a, in a fine article on the lectionary that it, it appeared on, the, if some of you know the Mockingbird website, um, it's a nice article that was on Mockingbird by Sarah Hinlicky Wilson, who's an excellent Lutheran preacher. And, and she pointed out, you know, I mean, uh, we, we actually don't get much of the passion narrative until Passion Tide itself. I mean, it's as if we, we have the, 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 the ministry of uh, the healings and the teaching and, and so on. And you see, I think the reason, the way this feeds our bad habits is this, that the synoptic Jesus looks like low-hanging fruit. Because we can take a story and then we can moralize it to death. And we can try to look for the lesson it teaches, the sort of social program that it announces and whatnot. This seems like a very followable, practi practical, accessible Jesus. Now, I don't think that even with the synoptics, it's that easy. If we were reading those texts well, we wouldn't treat the text that way. But one of the great things about John is John makes it impossible. <laughs> or John makes it, at least John makes it more difficult for us to moralize the text. Um, now, for those of you in uh, non-Anglican evangelical churches, or perhaps some Ang Anglican churches, um, instead of a synoptic cap captivity, there may be a kind of Pauline captivity uh, where you focus on themes of grace and justification, sanctification, which are wonderful, fantastic themes. The danger there, and this relates back to what Peter was saying earlier about theological interpretation of scripture, the danger there is that doctrine is extracted from the text and then becomes a thing in itself that's actually more important than that. Here's the text, but the text was just a kind of series of hoops we had to just jump through to get the doctrine. And then once we've got our doctrine of justification, then we go off and we run with it. And I think part of, you know, there are theological assumptions and convictions that are embedded in this project of theological interpretation of scripture. And, but I think that one of them is the priority of scripture itself as the word of God over even the church's doctrine. Now far be it from me as a systematic theologian to dishonor ecclesial doctrine, uh, creedal formulations, and so on. I mean, I cut my teeth in theology as a reader of Karl Barth. If I can prove my coffee mug here, there, there, there's old Karl, right? Um, so all honor to doctrine, but the problem with a kind of a exclusive focus on doctrine is a, it becomes kind of intellectualizing in the end, where, and the, the, you know, Peter used the word imagination before. Part of what's involved in theological interpretation of scripture is a kind of attentiveness that is a different sort of attentiveness than the one we give to doctrinal formulations, whether it's Christology or the doctrine of the Trinity or the doctrine of grace. These are both important in the church's life, but I think what we've lost to a very great extent 
is the ability to inhabit Scripture deeply and to just dwell with the text. One of John's favorite words, the evangelist's favorite words, is to dwell, to remain menin. I'll talk about that in a bit. So compared with the synoptics on the one hand and Paul on the other, John offers for us, to quote Karl Barth, a strange new world. Along with Paul, he is considered the other great theologian of the early church. Indeed, in ancient Christian tradition, he is known as John the theologian, or theologos. Okay, a second reason to read John, um, and I've already hinted at this, because John summons us to think vertically as well as horizontally. We might say that John is a spacious gospel. We are deeply trained in the habit of asking what we can do with the Bible, what teaching or piece of practical wisdom we can derive from it, what its takeaway value is. John frustrates that purpose. It is divine action, divine mystery, divine election, all the way down. And in fact, uh, it, I found it quite interesting, in Robert Jensen's great systematic theology, um, he comments somewhere in there, I think it's in part two when he, in his ecclesiological section, and by the way, Jensen Systematics should be required reading for all priests and pastors, I think. It's a magnificent work. Um, but Jensen says that there is no more predestinarian book in scripture than the fourth gospel. Right? You did not choose me, I chose you. That's just like the tip of the iceberg on the doctrine of election that emerges out of John, right? So it's a deep, it's a highly vertical book, and it subverts our kind of, uh, you know, temptations toward moralism. Of course, all of scripture presents us with a divine mystery that we cannot master, but John does so in an inimitable and powerful way. John is a gospel we need to indwell more so that our, so that our preaching and church life can be more about God and less about our own agendas and preferences. Number three, on the importance of reading John, because John is a book filled with riddles. If you like a good mystery story, then you will like the Gospel of John. I mentioned Sarah Hinlicky Wilson a, the moment, a moment ago. Her father is also no mean theologian. His name is Paul Hinlicky. And in his book, um, Beloved Community, he has helpfully said that as apocalyptic parable is to Mark, and as paradox is to Paul, so the riddle or enigma is to John. John is just a, a book. You, 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 you can hardly open a page of the fourth gospel and, and not run across a riddle or enigma on the lips of Jesus, whether it's his body being the temple or it, uh, word to Nicodemus about a person must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. Before Abraham was, I am, what's that all about? Um, uh, John is, a, I mean, it's as if John has focused on the genre of the riddle to draw his readers into the divine mystery. Simply on a literary and linguistic level, it's often fascinating that way, but those literary clues are a clue to something theological and deeper. John's riddles take us deep into the heart of the mystery of Jesus' identity, as well as the reality and mystery of God. In reading this gospel, learning to negotiate the riddles is half the fun. And in the course of our time today, we will have occasion to explore two particular Johannine riddles, the first in chapter two and the second in chapter four. Last and not least of the reasons for reading the fourth gospel is that it is beautiful and wise. It is beautiful and wise. A few years ago, I, I, was, um, I, was at a, I was down at Duke University, and I was talking to Will Williman. Some of you may know Will Williman is a great preacher, Methodist preacher, author. He wrote Resident Aliens with Stanley Hauerwas. Anyway, I was talking with Will Williman, and he said that the older he gets, the more time he spends with John. You know, of course, there's, there's these, these sort of traditions in the early church that John is the aged apostle, and he's there in Ephesus, and he's just sort of, he doesn't talk much, except occasionally to say to his disciples, love one another, love one another. So it, it, it's a book that whether this is actually historically true or not, it gives the impression of a deeply meditated wisdom 
kind of somebody who has indwelt the mystery of Christ for a long time. There's that saying in the, or that goes back to the church fathers that the fourth gospel is like, it's like a pool that's shallow enough that a child can splash around in it and it's deep enough for an elephant to swim in. And I think that's true. I mean, that there's a, there's a profound mystery about John, but at the same time, in some respects, I mean, I think it's not accidental that John is often printed independently as a little booklet of its own because it offers a kind of simple entree into the Christian faith, but it, of course it's deceptively simple. You're drawn in with the, to the simplicity of the language and you discover, boy, now I'm in over my head. So it's, it's, it is beautiful and it is wise. Okay, enough of preliminaries. Let's get to the text itself and I'm going to start, I am a, I am a great believer in reading scripture aloud. I think it's one of the things we do right as Anglicans. I think that you know, we, get, we get lots of scripture. Even then, we get it in these sort of little packages that the lectionary gives us. I really believe in reading scripture aloud in a more extended way. Um, I used to teach a course on the book of Revelation. We would always conclude that course by gathering in the chapel and reading Revelation from start to finish. Try it some, it takes about an hour, and it is a powerful experience to do that. It will be interesting to try that with John as well. So the, the tail end of Cana of Galilee, I'll talk about the relationship between these pericopes in just a bit. So beginning with this, the fir- this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there, and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Okay, to begin with, an exercise in defamiliarization. This is, this is a very familiar text. Let's defamiliarize it. If you are a Jew in the first century, you know exactly what the temple is. It's that building in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. It is the Lord's dwelling, the place of worship and sacrifice. It's had a long history and multiple iterations from the tabernacle in the wilderness to the Solomonic Temple, one of the wonders of the ancient world, where the Ark of the Covenant resided in the Holy of Holies, to the somewhat disappointing Second Temple after the exile. More recently, Herod the Great has restored and expanded the temple complex. The temple is a historically complex reality. It is contested and fought over. It is desecrated and re-consecrated and rebuilt but in the end, it is simply and massively there. Or at least it will be until its final destruction by the Romans in the first Jewish war 
of 70 AD. Then one day, a, G a Jew named Jesus, a rabbi, appears in the temple along with his disciples. It is the season of Passover. Fashioning a whip out of cords, he begins to attack the merchants who sell sacrificial birds, sheep, and oxen. He scatters the merchant's coins on the ground and drives out the terrified animals. When the authorities ask him to produce some sign of his authority, he says, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. Since the rebuilding project under Herod has been going on for some 46 years, Jesus' claim seems delusional. No one has the slightest idea what he is talking about. Later on, Jesus' followers will have their own interpretation of his saying about the temple. What he was really referring to, they explain, was the temple of his body. That is the temple that he would raise up in three days. Of course, after Jesus' death, his body is no longer available to ordinary perception. But no matter, his followers believed he was still present to them by means of a mysterious intermediary known as the spirit or advocate. Not only would the spirit remind the disciples of the things that Jesus had said and taught, but he, she, or it would lead them into all truth. Jesus would seem to have passed his delusionality on to his disciples. As I said, I tell this story by way of defamiliarization. The so-called cleansing of the temple is a story we all know or think we know. It is one of the very few incidents recounted in all four Gospels. Already in the synoptics, it is a startling and violent episode, belying the Sunday school picture of Jesus as a warm-hearted teacher of a divine acceptance and inclusion. In the synoptics, the temple incident seems to be a forecast of the destruction of the temple, an event that Mark at least connects with the eschatological days of the Messiah, sort of the little apocalypse in Mark 13. But in characteristic fashion, the fourth evangelist shifts the focus from God and God's coming kingdom to the person of Jesus himself. Jesus is the temple, and the temple is Jesus. What can that possibly mean? Is it a riddle, a parable, an equivocation, a metaphysical claim masquerading as an architectural metaphor? Whatever it is, it is certainly very, very weird. What exactly is going on here? If you read the commentaries, and you should, but not only read the commentaries, you need to do your own exegesis. If you read the commentaries, you will, of course, find explanations. One of the most common is this. What Jesus is doing is demonstrating in an especially vivid way the outmodedness of the Jewish sacrificial system centered on the temple and its cult. Under the old covenant, the temple was the site of the Lord's presence in Israel. But now God is consigning that system to the dust heap of history. From now on, not the temple on Mount Zion, but the risen body of Jesus will be the site of encounter with God, the holy place to which, anticipating the passage we will explore this afternoon, the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and truth. Let's call this the replacement theory of Jesus' relationship to the temple. And let's be honest, it has a certain prima facie plausibility to it. First comes the temple, then comes Jesus. First comes Israel, then comes the church, which worships God in and as Jesus. Indeed, on several occasions, the Apostle Paul says that the bodies of Christians are the temple, either individually, do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, or as the ecclesia, the body of Christ. And both of those usages appear in 1 Corinthians. A sequential or salvation history understanding of the Jesus temple relationship would seem to fit this Pauline theology of the temple very well. First comes Israel, then comes Christ. First comes Israel, then comes the church as the so-called true temple. I'm sure you've already guessed that I am suspicious of this view of the matter. 
I think the reality is more complex than that, that the riddle, you might say, asks for a different sort of solution. I want to propose that we hold on to the weirdness of this passage just a bit longer in hopes that a more satisfying, multidimensional answer to the enigma might begin to emerge. The first thing to notice, I would suggest, is the close relationship between our passage and the one that immediately precedes it, namely the miracle at Cana, where Jesus turns water into wine. And Annette and I actually discussed the possibility of including the Cana passage today because it's so beautiful and so powerful, but there's only so much you can deal with in a day. You have to sort of um, you know, humbly acknowledge your limitations. So that, but there's a close relationship with, uh, to, to the miracle at Cana. After the gathering of the disciples in chapter 1, this is the first truly narrative episode in John's Gospel. And there are multiple resonances between that story and the temple episode. Both occur at a Jewish feast, the first at a wedding, the second at the Passover. Both involve a sign that elicits puzzlement on the part of other characters in the story. Both are marked by a dialogue that in a certain way serves as the key to interpreting the sign. In the Cana episode, this is Jesus' exchange with his mother, and in the temple incident, it's the debate between Jesus and the Jews, hoi iudaioi. Both stories finally conclude with the disciples' reaction to the event. Seeing his glory and believing in him in the first case and remembering the scriptures in the second. To be sure, the tone of the stories is very different, right? The tone of Cana and Galilee, it's sort of the springtime of Jesus' ministry, and it's the sort of this wedding milieu, turning water into wine. It's kind of celebratory and festival. There is that little hint of my hour is not yet come. So even in the Cana story, the, the passion, I mean, there's no part in John where the passion is not foreshadowed. <laughs> But in Cana, it's relatively joyful and upbeat, and in the temple story, it's really serious, down, down, down to brass tacks. But, but the, two, the two texts form a kind of diptych with each other. Secondly, so we've noted the relationship with the Cana story as context. Second, let's look at the structure of our passage, and you do have on your, I, I've given you an outline of both of our texts for today. The story falls into um, two distinct parts, two main parts of dialogue between Jesus and the woman, and, and that's quite typical of John, that a dialogue begins at a certain level and then goes deeper, but then it's framed on either side by an introduction and, and a kind of postscript. So the, the introduction is this transi little transitional verse, 2.12. Jesus, his mother, brothers, and disciples stay in Capernaum a few days, 2.12, then 2, 13 to 17 narrates the temple incident itself. By the way, you'll notice I'm not calling it the cleansing of the temple because that sort of, that assumes too much, I think. I'm not sure that cleansing really captures it the best. Um, and it's concluded by, with a citation from scripture, Psalm 69. Then C, to 18 to 22 is the dialogue with the Jews after the incident what sign do you give, and so on. And that part is concluded by the disciples remembered the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And then you have a little postscript, 23, verses 23 to 25, uh, concerning the value of signs and Jesus' uncanny knowledge of people. He did not entrust himself to signs because he knew what was in a person, and so on. Now, for right now, I'm going to skip the, that curious little transitional verse at 2.12. I think it actually offers an important clue to the entire passage, but it will make more sense when we've gone through the rest of the material. So let's begin with the temple incident itself, starting with verse 13. It opens with an important indicator. The narrator tells us that the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Passover of the Jews is a pleonasm, a redundancy. It's like saying the Christmas of the Christians or the Muslim Ramadan. I mean, John is sort of, he's making unmistakably clear the Jewishness of the, of the context in which he's telling this story. 
Um, and by the way, this is another link to the preceding Cana story, which signals its Jewishness in quieter ways. It's a Jewish wedding. All of the, it's in Galilee. All of the participants are Jews. Jesus, his mother, the disciples, the bride and the bridegroom, and so on. We have all these echoes of the Lord's marriage to his people, you know, sort of daughter, daughter Zion language in the prophets and so on. Um, but here, it's, it's up front. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. Passover season in Jerusalem at the temple. This entire situation might well be described as time and space saturated in Judaism. And note that Jesus is said to go up to Jerusalem, anabino. It's the typical language used to describe pilgrims making their way to the holy city. So um, Psalm 122, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord. They go up to Jerusalem. This language is used in Acts all the time to describe people going up to Jerusalem. So what does this particular pilgrim, Jesus, do to mark the occasion. He's in town for Passover. He fashions a whip of cords, he drives out the money changers and the animals, and generally makes a nuisance of himself. From the earliest days of the church, commentators have noted that there's something fundamentally odd about all this. Commerce in the temple complex, per se, was not prohibited. We are not talking about the Holy of Holies, after all. This is, these are the, the, the larger temple precincts. Worshippers coming to the feast needed animals to sacrifice and coins, not idolatrous Roman ones with the emperor's image, that they could use to buy the sacrifices. Think of Mary and Joseph at the presentation in the temple. In Luke, Jesus' own earthly parents made sacrifices at the temple and participated in this system. No doubt having commercial activity in the temple precincts is distasteful, but distastefulness alone doesn't seem a sufficient explanation for Jesus' rather over-the-top reaction to the merchants. Distastefulness is an Anglican theological category and probably not the best one, not the best hermeneutic to help us here. Okay. So I said, so this over-the-top reaction to the merchants, and over-the-top indeed, I think that Jesus on this occasion is being deliberately hyperbolic, exaggerated, extreme, in the tradition of Israel's prophets. Jeremiah walking naked through the streets of Jerusalem, Ezekiel lying on his side for weeks at a time and eating animal dung, dung and so on. Jesus is performing a sign, and what the sign is saying is that the temple in its current form is no longer sustainable. If there can't be the traffic in sacrifices, and the ancient commentators will say this, Origen will say this, if Jesus is driving out the, the sellers and the animals, he's actually sort of expelling these, these animals from the temple, how can that not be a sign that the end of the sacrificial system itself is at hand? If I were writing a Bardian-style commentary, I might call this passage the end of religion. But what will religion or cult, or sacrifice be replaced with. It will be replaced with nothing but the Lord's own presence. So Jesus says, you shall not make my father's house a house of trade. Notice that this is the first time in John's gospel that the word father appears on Jesus' own lips. And it will appear a lot more before the gospel is over. The father's sending of the son into the world, the son's taking on our flesh and dwelling among us, this just is the divine presence, God's visible and material availability to his people. In short, the temple. The temple is the Father's house, and the Son, or word of God, is that house. Now, this is all a bit embarrassing, because it would seem I have ended up exactly where I said I didn't want to end up, namely with Jesus as a replacement for the temple. I've just given you a little replacement theory, haven't I? And I've ended up there for good reason, because I think the replacement theory, although wrong in the end, comes within a hair's breadth of being right. 
Now, that hair's breadth is important. It is nearly right because our passage does, after all, speak of death and destruction. The scripture verse remembered by the disciples on this occasion is from Psalm 69, zeal for your house will consume me. Psalm 69 was a favorite psalm among early Christian writers, read by them as referring to Christ's passion. Jesus is the suffering righteous one, the Israelite who bears the reproaches of the Lord's enemies yet remains faithful to the end. Zeal for your house will consume me. It will devour me or eat me up. It will result in my death. And by the way, if you want to read a wonderful analysis of the way that John uses this psalm and other Old Testament materials in his gospel, you must read Richard Hayes' account in his book from a couple of years ago, Echoes of Scripture in the Gospels. It's a big, fat book from Baylor University Press. Every pastor and priest should have that book in his or her library. That is, it's just a wonderful book. And, and the, 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 the individual chapters on the fourth go four Gospels, each one functions almost as a mini commentary on the Gospel, but with a, on that Gospel, but with a focus on John's use of the Old Testament. So Richard Hayes is just a peerless interpreter, and I would commend that book to you. So six, Psalm 69 is then the correct hermeneutic for understanding Jesus' action in the temple. It points us directly to the passion. But the Jews, the Eudaioi, do not know this. And so they ask Jesus for a sign, some proof that he possesses the authority to perform this act of judgment. And Jesus responds by saying, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. This is a kind of a Semitic way of speaking. We might paraphrase, Go ahead, destroy this temple, do your thing, and I will do mine. An imperative that is really a kind of dare on the part of the speaker. Look at Amos 4.4 for this way of speaking. The Eudaioi, the Jews, wrongly imagine that Jesus is claiming what uh, Edwin Hoskins calls grotesque architectural capacity. I love that phrase, grotesque architectural capacity. They point out that the temple has been under construction for 46 years. The number has been parsed symbolically in multiple ways, but there's no consensus about it, so it's better to stick with the plain sense here. It's just 46 years. And therefore, Jesus' claim of rebuilding in three days is absurd. The narrator then comment, comments, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. Jesus' word plus the comment by the evangelist is the crux of the passage the central riddle that demands to be solved. So notice it's a twofold riddle. It's, 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 the, um, it's Jesus' word, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days, and then the narrator's comment. Now it's interesting, in our modern editions of, of, of the Bible, I mean, usually that comment by the evangelist, let me just say that comment, is put in parentheses. But there are no parentheses in ancient, you know, papyruses, manuscripts, cod codices. It's... Just, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. So this, this, this is the twofold crux, the riddle that demands to be solved. Now all sorts of pitfalls await the unwary reader of this text. And the biggest danger, I think, is, is that of a kind of wooden spiritualism. And, and by the way, because, I mean, as you all know, I'm sure, John often levels, uh, operates at these two levels of understanding, multiple levels. The I mean, there's a surface meaning of a saying or a story, but then there's a deeper meaning, and characters in the story are not getting it, but the narrator is getting it, and because, and because we are readers and we are privileged to have the narrator's point of view, we are getting it, and I think that um, there's a great hermeneutical temptation here to think, ah, we know better. We know better than the characters in the story, and then we pat ourselves on the shoulders. This hap by the way, this happens in the synoptics too. I find, you know where it happens? It happens in Mark, because you have this theme, yes, it's in, undoubtedly there, of the incomprehension of the disciples, and they don't understand who Jesus is, is, and Peter is scandalized that he has to suffer, et cetera, et cetera. And so this leads to the kind of sermon that I call the poor dumb disciples sermon. Right? It's sort of this condescending attitude toward the disciples, and we know better, is, is implied. 
I thought that disciples did pretty well under the circumstances, what had happened to them, okay? Okay, so as readers, here back in our text, we assume that the Jews must be wrong and the narrator of John must be right, so John happily shares his knowledge with us. So Jesus is not referring to the temple as a building, but to his body, to the resurrection, and so on. And this opens the door to the replacement theory I talked about earlier. But this interpretation cannot be correct. It cannot be correct because there is no indication in the narrative that Jesus is doing anything other than referring to the physical structure that is Herod's temple. Destroy this temple. What would people think he was talking about? They would think he was talking about this temple. To be sure, and to put all the cards on the table, there is a sh slight shift in vocabulary. At the beginning of the narrative, the Greek word used is hieron, which encompasses the whole temple complex, while Jesus' saying uses the word naos, a word that denotes the inner shrine or the sanctuary. But I don't see this as decisive. Because after all, the naos, the shrine, the sanctuary, that too is a physical architectural space. And Jesus' opponents, after all, take the word in its architectural sense. In other words, the key to interpretation is found not in a variation in vocabulary, but in the interaction between the architectural and the Christological meanings. Instead of a neat either-or, the text opens up when we consider that a mysterious both-and is at play here. Not an either-or, but a both-and. And the commentator I find most helpful at this point, and I mentioned him earlier, is Sir Edwin Hoskins, his, his commentary on the fourth gospel, uh, you know, he died tragically young. He was only in his 50s when he died. He was one of the leading New Testament scholars in Britain, died in 1937. The commentary comes out in 40. It's only partly revised by the time he dies. But it's still, if you can get it online, find it in a used bookshop, pick it up. It's a gem. He was one of the great Anglican interpreters of the fourth gospel. Now, Hoskins points out that both of the verbs that Jesus uses destroy, luo, and raise up, agero, both of these can be used in ancient Greek to refer to either buildings or bodies. You can destroy a body by killing it, and you can destroy a building by knocking it down. You can raise a building by constructing it, and you can raise a body by resurrecting it, at least on an early Christian understanding of reality. Drawing on these observations about language, Hoskins writes, and I quote, the words can therefore be taken literally. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rebuild it. Or figuratively, kill this body, and in three days I will raise it from the dead. Or by a mixture of both. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise this body from the dead, i.e., to take its place, end quote. This is almost right. As both this passage and his wider discussion makes clear, Hoskins grasps that the meaning of Jesus' saying comes into focus as we consider the complexity of the referent. Jesus is referring both to the temple on Mount Zion and to his body. Hoskins' only misstep is when he says that Jesus' risen body will, quote, take its, that is, the temple's place. There is nothing of this in the text. Rather, we must think of both reference, Jesus' body and the holy place of the Jews, as being dissolved and rising again. Perhaps we could add to Hoskins' three imagined readings a fourth. This is my own formulation. Kill this body, kill me, and in three days I will raise this temple. Now this is not to invalidate the element of destruction involved. Just as Jesus' body is killed by his enemies, so the temple will undergo a wrenching transformation, a death of sorts. Historically, the temple went through many such deaths, beginning, we might say, already with the capture of the ark by the Philistines. Solomon's grand temple was looted and destroyed by the Babylonians. The temple was rebuilt, but it was never the same. 
Antiochus set up a blasphemous pagan altar in the Holy of Holies, the Romans put a definitive end to the temple cult in the Jewish war. And let us be clear that we are not just talking about buildings here. The many deaths of the temple are a synecdoche for the deaths of the Lord's people across the ages, their disobedience, their travail in exile, their loss, their love, their longing to be and to dwell in the Lord's presence. There are numerous passages in scripture that attest to this longing, but the words of the psalmist in Psalm 27 seem particularly apposite. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, naos, for he will hide me in his shelter, skene, in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent, Eskene sen me en skene. I'm quoting from the Septuagint here, the Greek Old Testament. He will lift me high upon a rock. I mean, that Psalm 27 is saturated in this temple tabernacle language, and it, it's echoed in the pro prologue to the gospel. The word became flesh and eskenosen, tabernacled among us. The resurrection of the Messiah, in other words, the Son of God, takes all the deaths of the temple and of God's people and covers them with his tent. In Christ's death we die, and only so are raised up. This is what might be called Christianity 101. We are raised up so that we might dwell in the tabernacle that is Christ's risen body. Jesus' body, then, is not the new temple in the sense of being a successor or chronological replacement for the old one. That way lies not just supersessionism, but an attenuated theology, Christology, and doctrine of Holy Scripture. Rather, Jesus' body just is the temple of the Lord, while the temples of Israel's history and of Scripture are its figures. I couldn't help thinking a few weeks ago, just before Easter, when, when Notre Dame, Notre Dame burned. I just felt this, you know, pain in the pit of my stomach to watch that. You know, the, the, church, in, the church in all its corruption and all its glory was shown forth in that image. That's the church in all its corruption and all its glory that Christ takes to himself, both under the old covenant and under the new covenant. Biblical types are not so much replaced by their antitypes as they are taken up and established by them, allowed their rightful place as pointers and witnesses to the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Nor does this kind of figural relation only obtain with respect to the realities of the old covenant, law and temple and so on. The church too functions as a figure or figures. The fabric of scripture is such that human existence is drawn into the very life of Jesus, not through some vague general divine presence in all things, but through the forms that scripture gives us. And one of these forms, as we have just seen, is that of the temple. I'm drawing to a close here, I promise. The church, too, of course, is a temple or the temple. I quoted Paul earlier, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Paul is not kidding when he says this. He immediately goes on to say, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him or her. For God's temple is holy and you collectively, you plural, are that temple. Paul is saying that the church is God's temple, although later in the letter he will use temple for the individual Christian body. It would take us too far afield to explore this Pauline usage in any detail. In ecumenical ecclesiology, temple of the Holy Spirit is one of the three main categories for understanding the church, along with people of God and body of Christ. The church as the temple is a theme worth exploring. I would only say, however, by way of caution, that the church as temple must be seen as derivative of Christ as the temple. In other words, Christ as the temple has to come first, only as we are joined to Christ by faith and baptism, the sacraments, the word of God, only as we are joined to Christ do we become the temple. 
If we move too quickly into ecclesiology at this point, we will end up with that unhappy picture of Israel being superseded or replaced by the church, replacement theology with a vengeance. But if we acknowledge Christ as the temple, Christ indeed as identifying with and identified by Israel as a whole, then the church will find its rightful, modest place in the economy of God. The church is the temple then, only in a derivative sense, and yet that sense is important. The church is the place, the space, the body, where Christ as the temple is made known, where human beings can have access to the Father through his beloved Son. In the fourth gospel, the church is displayed and hinted at more than it is talked about openly, yet it is there. It reminds me, I read somewhere that there, there's a basic principle in post-colonial criticism that in any given book from the modern Western canon, whether it's Charles Dickens or George Eliot or Jane Austen or whomever, there's always going to be one or two sentences that give away the colonial suppositions of the setup. Well, similarly in John, and I think in the, in the Gospels, it's not about ecclesiology, it's about Jesus. But because it's about Jesus, the church is everywhere if you know how to look for it. It is there. This allows us to go back to the puzzling little passage I mentioned earlier, that little transition at uh, ver uh, chapter 2, verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days, literally not many days. Jesus goes down to Capernaum in Galilee before he goes up to Jerusalem as a pilgrim. Capernaum is a resting place where he abides with his family, both his natural family and the new family he is in process of creating with his disciples. The Greek word translated here as remain is, of course, meno, to dwell or abide. It is one of John's most important words indicating the relationship between Jesus and his followers. It's just a small touch. It's just one verse. But this scene serves as a figure for the life of the church. Just as Jesus' action in the temple in John 2 constitutes a bracket with his passion, for it is at the cross that we see the divine temple in all its glory. So the dwelling in Capernaum constitutes a bracket with the scene where Jesus entrusts his mother to the beloved disciple and vice versa. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. The church fathers often took this episode as depicting the creation of the church as the new family. So, even before Jesus, is, Jesus declares that he will raise the ruined temple in three days, the evangelist hints at the new community that will come about through his death and resurrection. That's all she wrote. 